For a long time, the tourism industry in Africa has been among the top honor for most countries, bringing in collective revenue of $168 billion and creating jobs for 24.6 million people in 2019 alone. However, the COVID-19 pandemic brought the industry to its knees. In Rwanda, tourism is the largest source of foreign exchange earnings and was the biggest contributor to the national export strategy pre-pandemic. The Rwandan government spared no efforts to aid the recovery of the hard-hit sector. Welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. In this episode, we look at the current state of the tourism sector in the country, the recovery efforts, as well as Rwanda's conservation milestones. I'll be your host, Tessie Carbon. Known as the land of a thousand hills, Rwanda's stunning scenery, pleasant weather, unique culture, as well as extraordinary biodiversity and wildlife drew tourists from around the world, many of them coming to catch a glimpse of the country's famous gorillas. On the 14th of March, 2020, the unexpected happened. Rwanda reported its first case of COVID-19, a virus many initially thought was too far off. In response, the government took strict lockdown measures to contain the spread of the deadly virus. And as the Director General of the Rwanda Chamber of Tourism tells us, the tourism sector immediately felt the impact of these measures, with the pandemic eventually eroding the numerous gains made in the sector, setting it back 15 years. Oh, the impact was uh, really so extremely adverse, I would say, uh, whereby, uh, for example, uh, if I would talk in terms of numbers, uh, on jobs in particular, uh, our sector, the tourism and hospitality sector, uh, we have a bigger proportion from small uh, micro enterprise SMEs. And here, uh, we're counting, we conducted a survey, a survey recently, uh, which as the Chamber of the Rwanda Chamber of Tourism commissioned and indicated that over uh, 19 thousand uh, jobs uh, were affected whereby uh, people either lost their salaries or salaries impacted by you know uh, in terms of reductions but also looking at the youth and the women who are our uh, bigger uh, workforce in the sector uh, we're talking about over 8,000 jobs lost so that uh, indicates that really uh, the heat was tremendous uh, to extremities of uh, 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 where really the loss up to now we are suffering uh, uh, from those adverse effects. But again, on a bigger, on a micro, of, um, on a macro point of view, you're talking about uh, about 75 percent of sales revenue uh, lost. Uh, that was uh, over the past. Uh, uh, yeah, here uh, well, the implication it takes us back to about 15 years ago, uh, where we were in tourism. So, all the progress we had made uh, over the last uh, decade and a half. Small players in the tourism sector were hit particularly hard, with some of them closing down completely. When you look at uh, the sector, the whole general sector in Rwanda, uh, in, in the past few years before the pandemic, this, the, that probably in five years this is when uh, lots of our uh, startups in the tourism sector were coming up and boom the tour the pandemic came up and most of them didn't survive so when you ask the impact how does it really look like we're talking about uh, most of offices being closed we're looking at uh, uh, jobs being lost and the tourism sector was employing a very huge number when you look at the community tours you look at um, all these activities based at the lakes, uh, in the parks, and uh, the whole benefits uh, alongside the, 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 uh, the destination uh, points. So most of these people lost their jobs. And right now, to come up, you know, if you close the office to get back in business, it's an issue because setup costs much more than actually closing. So the huge percentage in the tourism sector closed completely. 
Rwanda was not the only country whose tourism sector was on its knees as a result of the pandemic. Other tourism-dependent economies were almost killing over. Just like any other country, Botswana was highly affected and the uh, tourism sector came to a standstill. Pre the pandemic, uh, the tourism sector was contributing about 4.5% to the GDP. However, by the end of 2020, the contribution had contracted by 40.3%. And uh, to date, I believe um, it's beyond that. We are still undertaking a study to establish uh, the impact beyond, you know, the, just the contribution to the GDP and even the other socio-economic factors that were uh, affected by the pandemic. To prevent total collapse of the sector, governments had to act fast. Rwanda put in place a $100 million recovery fund targeting, among others, the tourism and hospitality sectors. We really, uh, as well, we still right now appreciate government, you know, intervened uh, really swiftly. And that's when we had about the $100 million US do dollar, uh, support uh, recovery fund earmarked for tourism recovery. Uh, whereby loans of these hotels and other actors were, you know, uh, restructured. And that was really great, as uh, that was the immediate intervention as per recovery. But also we looked much more into uh, uh, digital, going digital, uh, much more. Yes, our industry, of course, bookings are much more online and, you know, you know, travel agents do their work online still, but now we started looking at avenues whereby we, can, we could improve our, you know, digital activity and proactive. By encouraging the use of digital means to adapt to the new normal, the tourism industry was able to retain some of its customer base and continue cross-engagement. And as the pandemic slowly phases out, the country has made a massive investment to offer a new attraction to the coming influx of tourists in the new season, a rare species, the white rhinos. Brought in from their native land, South Africa, the 30 critically endangered white rhinos will share the Akajera National Park with the previously translocated black rhinos, bringing the total rhino population in Rwanda to 56 and adding significantly to the country's conservation efforts and its position as an ecotourism hub in Africa. Our progressive conservation policies make Rwanda an attractive place for investment in sustainable tourism that has attracted uh, leading brands um, across the world and from Africa in, uh, in to invest and diversify our offering in tourism in uh, national parks like this. We've been able, because of uh, our strategy and our vision, we've been able to attract uh, brands like the Wilderness Safaris, uh, African Parks uh, itself, uh, Singita, one and only. So. Our commitment, this translocation renews our commitment to conservation, renews our commitment to deliver impactful investments. And we are investing, uh, we are uh, uh, inviting investors to see wilderness areas as places that can create value. And we're inviting them on our journey to join us and invest with us um, in creating value for conservation, value for uh, wildlife, value for people and value for the economy and value for their own businesses as well. According to the World Wildlife Fund, there are currently 20,000 southern white rhinos in the world. White rhino populations decreased by 12% between 2012 and 2017. With large tracts of green paddy land to roam in the wild and free of poachers, the Akajara National Park will serve not only as home but also as a rehabilitation zone for the endangered rhinos, possibly allowing the 19 females and 11 males to further their line and contribute to the global population of rhinos in the wild. Rwanda is, uh, is progressive nation on the continent in my view right now with regards to conservation um, it does it right it does it with a lot of ethics um, and um, 
it's actually the international world that chose us. We didn't go out looking for the white rhinos. We were donated them. And um, so that's also a portrayal that people say, you know what, we see what Rwanda's doing. We see the conservation space. We want to give you rhinos because we know you can look after them. Yeah. Um, nobody will give something if they feel you're going to waste it or lose it or damage it. So um, just, just a statement for Rwanda. It shows how progressive it is. But if they stabilize, which hopefully they will do, um, gestation is 17 months, so I'd say in two years' time, 24 months, we should be looking forward to potentially receiving some white rhino calves. To be able to procreate, the animals will need a conducive environment, and the change of soil, climate, and even the air itself poses threats to their well-being. Several measures will be essential to ensure a smooth acclimatization of the white rhinos. Are there any threats here? What sort of threats am I talking about? I'm talking about things like disease. Now, in this particular instance, there is. Um, we are a bit concerned about the level of tsetse flies and the challenges that they're going to face with tsetse flies. They are at a bit of an advantage because they come from an area in South Africa which actually has tsetse, but not at the level that we see here in Akajira. So they've actually been injected already prophylactically um, just in case they suffer some side effects from trypanosomiasis carried by these tsetse. Um, we also need to look at the security aspects. Obviously, as a veterinarian, um, that's not up to me, but I need to be reassured that these animals are going to be looked after and we're not going to have poaching incidents. As a veterinarian, I always say to people, I clean up the mess afterwards because I go and do the forensics. And this year alone, we've lost over 90 um, animals in the particular reserve that I'm based in. The hope is that the white rhino population will multiply and grow, adding to the already attractive tourism ecosystem in Rwanda and reaffirming the country's commitment to conservation. And as Rwanda continues to invest in diversifying its tourism offering, the hope is that the sector will soon bounce back to its pre-pandemic levels, if not better. That's a wrap for today's edition of Doing Business in Rwanda. Thank you so much for watching. I've been your host, Tessie Carvin.